coronavirus completely disrupted our lives. For months, we were locked in our homes, unable to meet with relatives and friends, do proper exercise, and even go to work or school. Many of us spent way too much time on TikTok. The pandemic left many families heartbroken and traumatized, with almost 5 million deaths worldwide. Despite this, there have been some successes. As a scientist, I am thrilled that my family, friends and students are suddenly familiar with abbreviations such as PCR. I spent the last three years working in Parliament and still recall our meetings in early 2020. Out of the blue, our political discussions became scientific. I was having to explain the YAR number and other aspects of virology to officials. Clearly, in the age of COVID, many people have realised how important science has been, is and will be to our society. From apps that track cases in real time, to diagnostics, mathematical modelling, new medications, and of course, vaccines. The reason we are here today is because of scientists and their remarkable discoveries. Scientists have saved the day. Now that the whole country is listening to scientists, there is a golden opportunity to regenerate science in the UK. I say regenerate because I believe we need to reevaluate our approach to science. Although it might not seem obvious, we are not going in the right direction. Change is required. I have four concerns that I wish to explore today. My first concern relates to the financial investment or lack of in science. Historically, the UK has always championed science and British scientists, including Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, Alexander Fleming, myself, and many others have changed the world for the better, I like to think. The UK has also won the second highest number of Nobel Prizes after the US, and in 2018 produced 7% of the world's scientific publications. Sounds like the UK has done rather well, right? Let's now look at it for a different angle. The angle of economic performance, which is widely regarded as the best indicator of the actual impact of science on society. The European Commission publishes an annual ranking of the world's best performing R&D research and development companies. In 2019, not a single UK firm made the top 25. Economically, whilst London and the South East are productive, most UK regions are not. There are significant geographical imbalances in R&D spending. Let's explore our science budget in more detail. In simplified terms, GDP is the total income of a country. Currently, the UK spends 1.7% of its GDP on R&D. The goal is to increase that to 2.4% by 2027. Is this ambitious? Well, let's try and contextualise this number. Austria, Sweden, Switzerland, Germany, Japan already spend over 3% of their GDP on R&D. South Korea, over 4.5%. It seems strange to me that we are aiming for a target far below many countries. If the UK is to make the major discoveries that could transform the world, whether that's new drugs against diseases or new solutions to combat climate change, I believe we must triple our science budget in the next five years. More specifically, we should be spending 5% plus 
of our GDP on science, the highest globally. My second concern relates to the way in which scientific advice is implemented in government decision making. During the pandemic, we observed some of the greatest scientific successes of our lifetimes, including the super fast development of vaccines. Normally, it takes 10 years. We managed it in 10 months. The UK and the US were both labelled the best prepared countries in the world to respond to a pandemic by the Global Health Security Index. And yet, we have one of the worst COVID death rates globally. Our vaccine success has been overshadowed by a horrific mortality rate. In my view, there were many, many failures that ultimately proved catastrophic. For example, many studies confirmed that mandatory face masks on public transport and in shops reduced new infections in Germany by 45%. But the UK rejected the use of face masks at the beginning of the outbreak. Was this really a good decision? South Korea experienced MERS, another coronavirus, in 2015. And so they knew they had to monitor and follow up every case very carefully right from the start. As a consequence, South Korea did not implement a single national lockdown. In contrast, the UK had three, as we all know too well. Now, there were benefits to lockdown. I too enjoyed making banana bread and not using the Piccadilly line to get to work. But why didn't the UK use South Korea's test and trace model until May last year? UK's mortality rate is now 55 times higher than South Korea's. Of course, it's wrong and unhelpful to blame individuals. But moving forward, full transparency is required. New systems should be put in place to improve decision-making and communication so that we can properly prepare for future emergencies. My third concern is that investment in medical research does not always reflect population need. Of course, when I say we should invest in science, I don't just mean biological sciences. Chemistry, physics, engineering, all require more financial support. I would like to use hearing loss as a case study to illustrate my point. Hearing impairment is the most common form of sensory impairment in humans, but is one of the most underfunded disorders. UK research health analysis shows that 83 pence is spent on hearing research for every person affected. Over 16 pounds is spent on vision research for every person with sight loss. Still low, but significantly more. And we now have gene therapy for blindness, a fantastic achievement. But actually, hearing research attracts a low amount of funding relative to the scale of the problem. In the UK, two million people suffer from vision impairment. 12 million people suffer from hearing loss, ranging from mild auditory impairments to complete deafness. Imagine if we could take a pill and hear perfectly again. So, why do we neglect this problem so much? One reason is that our politicians are not particularly interested in investing in research they will not get credit for. The average length of a British Prime Minister in office is around five years. The average length of a Secretary of State is two years, and science requires time and patience to achieve results. A scientific development normally takes 17 years. By the time results are produced and published, there may be another Prime Minister in Downing Street who will benefit from those discoveries. I believe we need long-term science secretaries who are science experts. 
The last concern I would like to raise is the unhealthy environment scientists experience. I would briefly like to mention scientists in training, often referred to as PhD students. Doctoral researchers can work in both academia or industry and are known for their excellent analytical skills, logical and independent mind, and great attention to detail. But alarmingly, 70% quit academia soon after passing their PhDs. This requires urgent attention. We need to ask ourselves why so many talented individuals are discouraged from pursuing their scientific ambitions. The reasons are complex. Common justifications include poor pay, poor work-life balance, inadequate supervision, career uncertainty, a toxic environment. A survey performed by Nature shows that one in five experienced bullying or harassment during their programme. One in three required treatment for depression and or anxiety. The central theme is clear. Scientists in the UK do not feel valued enough. Scientists in the UK are also underpaid. On average, data engineers in Germany earn almost £18,000 more than in the UK. UK lecturers earn 45% less than Canadian lecturers, 34% less than Americans, and 16% less than Australians. The UK is a country of services. We pay our bankers, lawyers, etc. good salaries, and that's excellent. The UK should also be a country of research and development. To begin the process of science regeneration, we first need a culture change. Investing in scientists emotionally and financially is important. Science-driven innovation fuels economic growth and supports trade, manufacturing and national security. Without science, there is no medicine. Without science, there is no NHS. Whilst we do not know what the next 50 years of discoveries will bring, let's be ambitious and address global challenges collaboratively and professionally. Let's give our scientists a chance. Let's invest properly. Thank you very much.